Hi, welcome to the Sunshine Courses uh, accounting course. Um, this is a module that relates to some of the administration that you need to know about when you're doing accounting and bookkeeping. And in particular, it's going to cover some laws, some taxes, and we're going to touch briefly on social contract accounting or social accounting. So what we're going to cover today is the legal context in which accounting is prepared. We're going to talk about the legal entity, who actually are we recording accounts for. We're going to talk about contracts. We're going to talk a little bit about tax, about statutory regulations, and finally, something called social responsibility accounting, which is a bit of a new concept, but one that I think some of you might find interesting. So firstly, let me just talk about the legal context. Accounting is carried out within the context of a legal system that requires, uh, that allows some people to invest in other people's businesses. It allows companies to, uh, companies and individuals, I should say, to trade with one another. So that if somebody promises to do something, and doesn't fulfill that promise, they can employ the law, they can go and sue somebody to enforce that agreement. So everything we do within accounting is based within a legal context. Even taxes are part of the legal system. And when you talk about income tax or corporation tax or sales tax, it's all set up because of laws that require certain taxes to be paid in certain conditions, but it's all part of a legal context. So everything that we do within accounting and bookkeeping has a legal underpinning. And somewhere, if you are interested enough, you could go back and look at the underlying laws and that might help you interpret or decide what you need to do. But certainly as a very minimum, there's a lot of obligations we have within law and accounting. And the idea of a lot of the standardized accounting we do is it embodies a lot of the legal requirements before you even start. So it's such a huge topic, laws and accounting laws and taxes, that you can't possibly hope to cover it all in one uh, session. So this is really just an introduction to some of these concepts, but particularly the concepts that are more useful to know when you're doing accounting. And the first one I want to talk to you about, which seems a little strange, is called the legal entity. The question I'd sort of ask for you is, when we're doing accounting, who are we accounting for? So it seems quite sort of a simple or easy concept, but I want to distinguish an individual from a business entity. So you and I are individuals. If we go and work for somebody, They'll maybe pay us a salary. Um, it is just they pay us. They have a contract with us. They work with us. It is just us. But that's different from a trader who may have one or two employees, may have some partners, may have some outside investors. And when you pull everything together, that's known in law as a legal entity. And the law does something quite strange, which is it defines a business entity as being a person in its own right. So although that person doesn't have physical form, it's a corporate, it's a legal entity, it's deemed to be a person in its own right, where that entity can enter into a contract in its own name. So this is how you have a company, some of those are very big corporates, um, uh, Novartis, um, uh, IBM, Microsoft, these are very big corporations. They can enter contracts in their own name in the same way that you and I can enter contracts. So when we're doing accounting, what we're accounting for generally is the business entity, not the individual. Generally, that's sort of pretty obvious and pretty stand, pretty common sense. 
except when it comes to someone who's self-employed. And the question is, if you've got someone who's self-employed, where it's just them on their own, are they an individual or a business entity? And the answer is, if they're trading, it's easier to conceive them as a business entity, even if there's no difference between the business entity and the individual, because typically, if you're trying to work out with a business entity, it's profits or losses, you don't want to get confused between the entity and the individual's personal expenses. So if you're an individual and you've got salaries, you'll use that salary to go and pay for your personal living costs, your house, your accommodation, your food, your clothes. If you're a business entity, you don't really want to interfere with, you don't want to mix up your personal expenses with how the business itself is doing. You want to know if the business itself has made a profit or not, as distinct from the individual. So with a self-employed person, whenever I'm advising people to set up a business on themselves, I always suggest they set up a separate business bank account for the business to distinguish it from the individual. And if they're ever taking money from the business to treat it as a payment of a salary or a drawing is what it's typically called, but to distinguish the business entity from the individual so that we don't get bogged down in personal expenditure when we're trying to work out what the business, how successful the business is. So a legal entity is any entity that can enter a contract in its own name. And that might be a self-employed person. Um, it might be a partnership. Uh, it might be a limited company. It might be a charity. It could even be a government. Uh, a government uh, can set up, say, for example, something like a local council, local government, where it creates an entity in law, and that entity can enter a contract in its own name. It could, if you enter a contract with a government entity or an institution, you can, you can enforce that institution to pay for goods that you sold to it, just as they can sue you to honor your obligations to them. So a legal entity is any entity that can enter into a contract. And it's worth distinguishing individuals from the business entity. Generally, when we're doing accounting, we're accounting for the business entity. Now let's talk a little bit about the contracts because the contracts have such an important role in the timing of accounting. So contract, again, is a legal construct. It's something that the law provides and empowers, because if a contract is not honored, the nation will enforce that contract. So when you go to courts to prosecute someone, ultimately, if they don't pay when they need to, the courts will decide if they need to pay. And if they do, the courts will enforce payments. And ultimately, enforcing payments may mean sending in a bailiff or even summon, sending someone to jail. It's all part of the legal system that's set up that is at your disposal, which is embodied through a contract. And a contract can be quite simple. A contract is any agreement to deliver goods or services in exchange for payment. As it turns out, there's other types of contracts, but that's the main one we want to worry about when we're doing accounting. It's any agreement to deliver goods or services in exchange for a payment. Now, the agreement can be as simple as you going up to a friend in the street, saying to them, oh, I like your glasses. Can I have your glasses and I'll pay you five pounds for it, for them. And that's an agreement. The agreement is one person agrees to sell goods or services and the other agrees to pay for it. So an agreement is anything from as simple as an oral agreement to somebody saying, I agree to do whatever it is we're going to do, right the way through to a really complicated legal contract, which can last for sort of, you know, pages, hundreds of pages, or even thousands of pages. Um, and the reason why you tend to write down contracts rather than simply agree them orally 
is it's very difficult to prove at a later date if someone did agree on a contract and if you did agree on it what the terms were because it's very easy to say oh let me sell the glasses for five pounds but what happens if you mean different glasses so one person talking about these glasses somebody else is talking about some sunglasses they may have had in their pocket you may be talking across purposes um, or the five pounds might be well i'll pay you five pounds but not now i'll pay them for you in six months time but only if they work so the idea of writing down a contract is to be explicit about what everyone is expecting in terms of what it is you're delivering when you're delivering what payment you're expecting and when you're expecting payment for and typically you go to lawyers to draft a contract because it's so easy to mistake the wording of the contract where you actually end up meaning saying something that's different from what you mean and of course contracts being part of the legal system means that it may well be that if you have a disagreement about what a contract means you'll put it in front of a judge and there's certain words in law that have very specific meaning and lawyers are very well versed in what those wordings mean so a lawyer knows the sort of things that are difficult to agree on or that you forget to agree on if you don't have a, a formal contract and they will put this together in a way that both words things so precisely that a judge will have no questions or no problems in interpreting it but also to cover the things that you might not think about because it doesn't even occur to you might be an issue such as what happens if i buy the glasses but they turn out to not work in the way that i expect them to be working what's the provision if i don't think the goods were as were fit for purpose when you were selling them and a contract will cover a whole series of all the things that you're expecting and all the things a whole load of things as to what to do if things go wrong so a contract is simply an agreement and typically you'll write it down and typically you'll sign it and date it and the contract has a date so i'm going to use in this example that the contract date was in january and what the contract provides is that one person one entity will deliver some goods and services another person or entity will pay for them so in February, the person who's delivering the services delivers them. Could be um, uh, selling glasses, it could be delivering cars, it could be um, serving food at a restaurant, whatever it is, the delivery takes place in February and you can either deliver goods or services. Once the goods or services are delivered, we then raise an invoice to request payment. So an invoice is simply a request of payment, a requirement for payment in a certain period. And typically in an invoice, you will uh, request payment, for example, in say 30 days from delivery, or invoice is payment on presentation of this invoice, or invoice is payable on delivery of the goods or services. You'll normally specify that in the contract and the invoice will confirm what it is that you're expecting and then in this example that happens in March you send the invoice in March and then you have the payment in April and one of the challenges for accounting is which is the correct period in which to account for these goods or services is it the date of the contract or the date of the delivery of the goods or services or the date of the invoice or the date of the payment and without going into too much detail the general answer is it's the date of delivery of goods or services. And through the rest of this accounting course, we've talked about some variations to that general principle, but the general principle is you account for transactions on the date the goods or services are delivered. And there's various variations if you enjoy the benefit of that over different periods. Okay, so that's the legal context within which trading is carried out and as i said the legal system uh, is a huge system to effectively enforce trust between two parties and the, the the more explicit and clearer a contract is the less likely you are to have disagreements about what it is that you're delivering and what it is you're due to pay and when and generally the clearer the contract 
the less challenge you have in trading with people that something got forward. So it's always a good idea to be absolutely clear about what it is you're delivering, but this is all part of the legal context within which we operate and within which we do accounting. So one aspect of law which has a particular importance to accountants is taxes. And of course, the way taxes work is that business carries out transactions, governments need to get income to be able to pay for goods and services it provides to the general public and to redistribute wealth where there's obscene inequality or, or levels of inequality that need to be remedied. So there's three types of taxes that are generally most com uh, countries uh, implement. There's sales tax, there's trading profits, and there's payroll taxes. And what we're gonna do is briefly go through each of the taxes to give you a flavor of what they're about and to talk about how you account for the taxes. So the first we're gonna talk about is sales tax. I want to distinguish sales tax from a value added tax. Sales tax, and typically an example of uh, America uh, is a good example of where they have sales taxes. Sales taxes are simply a tax on the sales price of any goods you sell. So let's say you're selling um, ice cream for 10 pounds, a box of ice cream for 10 pounds, the government might say, right, I want 6% uh, tax on everything you sell. So the vendor charges not just the 10 pounds for the ice cream, but also 60p on top of that. So it'll charge 10 pounds 60 because that's 6% tax that by law, the government have said, you have to pay us. The vendor has to pay that six pounds to the government. And the uh, buyer, instead of paying 10 pounds for the goods, pays 10 pounds 60p for the goods. So as far as the buyer is concerned, it's all pretty simple. They can record the, uh, when they buy, they pay for the £10.60, they simply record bank payments of £10.60 or credit bank £10.60, debit, whatever the ice cream was, entertainment, uh, food. Um, if you're buying ice cream to resell it, that could be cost of goods. Whatever, the, whatever reason you're buying the goods, you would allocate it accordingly. So credit bank, debit, whatever it is um, that you need to debit, uh, to be appropriate for the business. I just want to show you how you record a transaction if there's sales tax. Um, incidentally, if you're in a country that has value added tax and you are not registered for VAT, if you're not registered to recover tax, then VAT, even though it's a value added tax, to you is the same as a sales tax because just as in a sales tax country, you can't recover the VAT. So if you are registered for VAT, there's a different way of accounting, which we'll explain in a minute. If you're not registered for VAT, you account for costs in exactly the same way as any other sales tax. So I'm going to illustrate how you account for it. And in some respects, it's pretty obvious, but in a couple of respects, it's a bit confusing. I'm gonna use an example of buying some goods of a thousand pounds on which sales tax, in the UK we call value added tax, um, on which sale tax of 20% is added. So the total purchase cost is 1,000 pounds and there's an additional tax of 200 pounds that's charged. So in a sales tax system or in a VAT system, value added tax system, which, for which you're not registered for VAT, this is how you account for it. I'm going to use the quick entry system, but you can use plenty of other um, facilities. You could use a journal, you could use a purchase entry. But I'm going to illustrate the principle, which is the same in all of them. I'm going to add an entry. We're going to make a payment. We're going to give it a reference of 2103.19. That's a reference back to the document that relates to this um, purchase. We're going to record it to purchases. And of course, whatever the account was, that you, whatever you were buying, it would go to that account if you were 
buying stationery, it would go to stationery. If you were buying travel costs, it would go to travel. But in this case, we're simply going to put it to purchases. The description, you can put whatever it is. I'm going to say purchase of goods. Obviously, you put whatever is appropriate to put in. Um, the invoice date will be the 11th of March. And this is the bit I want to highlight for you. On the invoice you've got, the amount net of tax will show was £1,000. And the tax, the VAT, will show as uh, £200. So you could, if you were uh, reminded to do so, you could put £1,000 here. And notice that the total amount is still 1,000, and you could try and put 200 pounds here. So you've got the net amount of 100, you've got VAT of 200 pounds, and the total amount is 12, uh, 1,200 pounds. You could record it like this, but if you do, notice that this rate has gone to a custom VAT rate, the VAT amount of 200 pounds, if I were to record this, my cost would show as a thousand pounds, not 1200 pounds. So the entry that would be made at the moment would be, uh, let me just put this date in, would be debit bank, 1200 pounds, credit purchases, 1000 pounds, and credit VAT, 200 pounds. That's what would happen, but that's not what we want to happen because the actual cost to us, even though the invoice says net amount of 1,000, VAT of 200, the actual cost to us is 1,200 pounds, not 1,000. So this applies in any um, VAT, any um, uh, tax system where you don't recover the sales tax. Um, uh, you would put a zero tax of zero rate, no rate, or you can call it exempt, or sometimes people call it outside the scope of VAT. But if you're not registered for VAT, or you've got a sales tax system, the net amount you would put in is the net amount inclusive of the tax, inclusive of the tax, and you put a VAT amount of zero, even though the invoice shows some VAT, because the VAT is not your tax, it's the cost to you is 1200 pounds. So let's just have a quick look. If I save and close this, let's look at the profit and loss account. So the profit and loss account shows purchases of 1200 pounds because that's what it cost us. And if we look at the balance sheet, the balance sheet simply shows a bank overdraft of 1200 pounds with uh, no other assets or liabilities. Just going to go back to the profit and loss account to reinforce the point. When we get charged an amount plus sales tax, if we cannot recover the sales tax, the cost that we record is the full cost inclusive of the sales tax, regardless of what the accounting system prompts you to do. It's only if you're VAT registered where you can reclaim VAT on purchases or you charge VAT on sales. It's only in those circumstances that you have to worry about the VAT in these quick entry boxes. And we're going to explain in just a minute what the, how you manage the VAT in these, uh, in these boxes of sales, purchases, or quick entry or in the other journals. vendor you receive 10 pounds 60p the 10 pounds goes to sales and the 60p should be a liability that you have to pay over to the government now i'm going to illustrate that with the value added tax because it works in very similar ways um, but um, um, but i want to distinguish sales tax from value added tax value added tax says we're going to charge say 20 pounds on what you sell so VAT in the UK is 20 percent but the problem with sales tax in America is this if you charge 60 six percent on what you sell 
and you've got three people in a chain. Let's say you have a company that, um, that uh, makes uh, wooden boxes. So one company um, uh, creates wood and sells the wood to somebody else. The person who receives the wood might do a little bit of indentation on the wood, make it, uh, maybe put some holes in uh, to make it easier to screw together and sell the wood with those holes in and perhaps with a few other bits of equipment to someone else who'll physically put it together. And that third person will sell it to the end consumer as a completed box, which might be a, a chest of drawers, for example. So this is what happens. The first person who sells the wood to the second one charges 6% because they have to sell, charge it at 6%. The second person who adds the, puts the holes in, charges the wood plus the holes. So let's say that they, the wood cost hundred pounds. And let's say the person doing the, 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 uh, the work on the wood charges an extra 10 pounds. So they're now charging 110 pounds to, the, to their customer. When they charge the 110 pounds, they've got to charge the 6%. But wait, they've already paid 6% on the wood, on the first 100 pounds. So when it comes to the second sale, you're charging 6% for a second time on the same wood. And when the third person pulls it all together and charges 120 pounds for the wood and having uh, put in the holes in the right place and having screwed it together and sent it to the end customer, they're now selling 100 and charging 120 pounds, charge 6% sales tax, but that wood is charged yet again for the third time, you're paying six pounds on the wood. So the issue with sales taxes, each time there's somebody else in the chain, the same item is retaxed. So of course, that's why the tax rates would be quite a lot lower in America than they are in the UK, for example. But in the UK, they have a different approach. They say, look, we don't want to um, have a tax system that disincentivize lots of different people taking part in the chain, because that's what happens with sales tax. The more people in the chain, the more taxes you pay. So value added tax says no, pay 20 pounds on what you sell, but if you have bought wood and you've paid tax, you can get that back. So each person in the chain only pays over to the government the added value, the additional amount they charge over and above what they pay to everyone else. So if we buy wood for buy, if we bought wood for hundred pounds and paid to our vet, the person who sold us to wood an extra 20 pounds, we've paid them 120 pounds. If we now sell that wood, maybe we've done an extra bit of work, we sell that wood for 150 pounds to the VAT on 20 pounds we only have to pay to the government the difference of 10 pounds. So the value, we pay, to pay tax on the value added, not on the total sales. But mechanically, because that can get quite complicated in terms of timing, we might buy goods in in one month and sell them in another month. The way it works is this, we pay our supplier a hundred pounds plus VAT, physically we pay out 120 pounds. And we record that 100 pounds is the cost to us of the wood, but the 20 pounds becomes a debtor. It's due back to us from the government at some stage in the future. That happens in the first month. In the second month, we sell 150 pounds worth of goods and we charge 30 pounds on it, our customer pays 180 pounds. <clears throat> so our customer pays 180 pounds, of which 30 pounds is VAT. We as a company receive 30 pounds of VAT 
but we've owed back by the government 20 pounds. So in the same way that we set up a, a debtor when we, of, of 20 pounds when we sold the original goods, we have a liability of 30 pounds when we sell the goods. The net amount is what becomes due of 10 pounds paid to the government. And I'm gonna show you how that works because although it sounds a bit complicated, in practice it works, uh, the, the accounting systems make this very easy for it to, to happen. So I'm gonna show you what the journal is when we sell goods. So when we sell goods, we're selling say 10,000 pounds. And on top of that, we charge 20% tax. So the total we, we charge to our customers is 12,000 pounds of which sales are 10,000 pounds and VAT is 2,000 pounds. Now of the 12,000 pounds, the 10,000 pounds is our sales. It's our money, it's our profits, but the 2,000 pounds is simply tax we collect on behalf of the government. So we collect it from our customer, it goes into our bank account, and at some stage in the future, we need to pay that money over to the government. So I'm gonna show you how this works in an accounting system. And I'm using the accounting system KPM, but lots of other accounting systems um, are equally appropriate and they all work pretty well in the same way. And this is the way it works. A lot of the work is done for you. And all I want you to understand is why and how it works. So I'm gonna create an invoice. This is a sales invoice. And I'm gonna sell it to ABC Limited. And I'm going to enter the item that we're selling. And in this case, I'm gonna sell a tractor, a 200V tractor, and I'm gonna sell 10 of them. And the price of each one is a thousand pounds. So the total sales value is 10,000 pounds. But look what happens here. There's a column saying that rate. And if I click on the list, it gives me lots of different VAT rates. And this is because I've set up the VAT rates. I've configured my accounting system to have different VAT rates. In this case, we've got a standard rate of 20% because I set it up this way. We have a reduced rate of 5%. And there's various other rates and I could set up a custom rate. But in this particular example, in the UK, we charge VAT of 20%. So 20% is charged on the 10,000 pounds. And 20% of 10,000 pounds is 2,000 pounds. And just by entering the number of goods I'm selling at 1,000 pounds, my software automatically calculates that I'm charging 10,000 pounds in total, that VAT on top of that is charged at 2,000 pounds. So my grand total is 2,000 pounds of VAT and 12,000 pounds is the amount my debtor owes me. So this is my debtor. And if I wanted to add more sales, I can just add more rows if I'm selling to this one person. But I'm just gonna stop at this point. And what this will do, this will put the entry through that I just described before, where it will debit sales, sorry, debit debtors, 12,000 pounds, because this is money that will be owed due to us. It will credit sales, because this is the account that I've defaulted it to, or let me put it to vehicle sales. And because I've defined it as being vehicle sales, it'll credit vehicle sales, and it knows to credit VAT because that's how the system has been set up. So I'm just gonna save this now. Let's just have a quick look at the accounts. Let's look at the profit and loss account. The profit and loss account, despite us invoicing 12,000 pounds, only shows 10,000 pounds because it distinguished what our sales are from the money we owe to the government. Let me look at the balance sheet now. The balance sheet shows debtors of 12,000 pounds. And it's also calculated the creditor of 2,000 pounds. As it happens with VAT, you build up the money that you've got for a three month period. 
And at the end of the three months, you've got a month to pay the VAT liability. So this £2,000 won't be due until 30 days after the end of the VAT quarter that it relates to. So a typical VAT quarter will be January to March. This happened in the month of March. So it happened in the quarter of January to March. The end of the VAT quarter is the 31st of March. This will be due at the end of April. Never mind that. Having put in this entry, it's automatically calculated, cal calculated my VAT. What about if we buy goods? Because the reverse should be true. Let's enter a purchase. I'm going to enter a new purchase. And I'm going to enter it from lighter supplies. Again, I'm going to enter the um, uh, what I'm buying. In this case, I'm going to be buying tractor tractors V200, I think it was. Um, let's say I buy it for £1,000. The account would send it to his purchases, vehicle purchases. The VAT rate is 20% again. And look what's happened. The system has automatically calculated that VAT of 20% on £1,000 is 200. So it's identified already that my creditor is not a thousand pounds but twelve hundred pounds that's what i owe to the creditor and the accounting entry that will be put through when this is sorted out is credit creditors because i've got a liability i have to pay this money to lighter supplies credit creditors twelve hundred pounds debit vehicle purchases of a thousand pounds debit vat of two hundred pounds so Let's save that and then have a look again at what's happened in the accounts. Go and look at the profit and loss account. And this time the profit and loss account now shows we've got vehicle sales of £10,000 and here's our vehicle purchases of £1,000, even though we paid £1,200 to our supplier because our profits are £900, £9,000, because VAT is irrelevant. It's not our money. We've simply collected money for the government or paid money to a supplier who will pay it to the government, where the government's going to pay us that money back if we're entitled to reclaim VAT. So VAT does not affect our profit and loss account because it's not our money that we're receiving or paying. It's the government's money. I'm now going to look at the balance sheet. And the balance sheet now shows, still got trade creditors of £12,000, We've trade debtors of £12,000. We've now got the trade creditors of £1,200. That's the £1,000 purchase we just put through, plus the £200 VAT. Look what's happened to the VAT. It was £2,000. It's now reduced to £1,800. It's the £2,000 that we owe to the government because somebody else is paying us £2,000. Less the £200 VAT we're paying to somebody else, but which the government's going to refund to us because we are that registered. So this is the mechanism by which we get the VAT back. And look, we've our value added is the £9,000, which is the £10,000 we sold, less the £1,000 that we purchased. So our value added is £9,000. And look, the VAT is 20% of £9,000. That's why this is called a value added tax. And if for some strange reason, our sale took place after the VAT period, and we had no, um, no debtors, the VAT did not reflect the £2,000 due to the government, but did reflect the £200 we paid to our supplier. Yes, the government actually sent us a check. They actually pay money into our bank, they would refund that money. So this creditor would actually be negative, a negative creditor is a debtor, and that correctly would show the debtor that the government owed to us, and they would pay the money back to us. And this is why VAT doesn't appear in the profit and loss account, because the money is always paid to or from the government, depending on which way it needs to go. But our balance sheet shows 12,000 pounds of debtors, 
1,200 pounds of trade creditors, VAT of 1,800 pounds, total liabilities of 3,000, creditors of 1,200, government of 1,800, the amount we owe in total are our net current, our net assets of 9,000 pounds, and that represents our profits of 9,000 pounds, so they are balance sheet balances. So we've just shown that any accounts, uh, any receipts or payments that you make, you can account for the VAT on it, and the system will automatically calculate the VAT. And just a quick um, pointer is that almost all accounting systems allow you to identify what your total VAT is for any accounting period, to create a VAT return formatted for government. In this case, it would show amount due of 1800 pounds, and there's a particular format that you require. You can list out the transaction details if you ever wanted to see what the transactions are made up of. Let's just have a quick look at that. So the transaction in this case are VAT on purchases, 200 pounds, VAT on sales, 2000 pounds. That's the VAT on the transactions. If we looked at the return report, this is the way the government require you to format it. This is our total output or our total VAT on sales is 2,000 pounds. Total reclaims is 200 pounds. The net difference is 1,800 pounds. This is what we have to pay to the government if there was no other VAT. And as it happens, we also disclose that we have sales of 10,000 pounds and purchase of 1,000 pounds. We don't need to know too much what this is all about. I just wanted to highlight that if you've got a, a system, an accounting system that manages VAT, all you have to do is to remember to put the correct VAT in your invoices, sales or purchase invoices, or your bank entries. And if you do, if you simply put the VAT rates in, the system handles everything else for you. And if we go back to the balance sheet, our balance sheet shows we a liability of 1800 pounds. And that's correct because when we send in the return, that 1800 pounds we need to physically pay to the inanimate to the government, HM Revenue and Customs in the UK. It's a liability, it's not our money. And if we'd received, if that 1200 pounds, 12,000 pounds had gone into our bank account, not all of that 12,000 pounds is our money. 1800 pounds of that belongs to the government. And this is one of the challenges of VAT is that particularly if you've got cash flow problems or the business you're working for has got cash flow problems, it's very easy to forget that some of the money in the bank belongs to the government. If you're desperate for money, you've got money in the bank, you need to pay creditors, you'll pay them, particularly if they're chasing you very hard. But remember, if you don't pay the government, the government also can come and request payment for you. And they've got some pretty vicious tools in their armory to encourage you to pay them in priority to other people. So just the challenge or the, the, the point you, I would just want you to be aware of is, if you've got a business that's slightly struggling with cash flow and they're asking you to pay creditors, always keep track of what liabilities you owe to the HM Revenue and Customs and you'll see with the other, some other taxes are due as well. Um, make sure you've got enough money to pay those liabilities when they become due, because it's not your money that's in your bank account. It's the government's money if you owe them VAT. So let me go back to the presentation. Okay, so the journal entry that the accounting system makes, well, even though you're not aware of it, is debit debtors, credit VAT, liability, credit sales. And the VAT return we've already seen, you have to disclose what your output tax is. That's the VAT on your sales. In this case, output tax of £20,000 on sales of £100,000. Input tax, in this case, we paid £15,000 to other people, on purchases of £75,000, the tax due to the government is £5,000. Okay, so that's VAT. So 
So the next tax I want to talk about is income tax or corporation tax. So income tax or corporation tax typically is a tax on profits for the year. That's typically how it works. And in this example, we've got profits of 10,000 pounds. And there are certain items that different countries do and don't allow in terms of expenses. So in the UK, they don't allow entertainment costs to be deducted from your profits. So, so if you, um, uh, if you had deducted 150 pounds, um, if your profits were 10,000 pounds after having deducted 150 pounds, you need to add those profits back in order to understand what your profits are. The same thing is true of legal fees. Certain legal fees are allowable against tax. Certain legal fees are not allowable against tax. And if you're, for example, buying property, if you're a property trader, you're not allowed to set those costs against your profits. So if your profits were set after having reduced, uh, after having deducted 900 pounds, you need to add back those 900 pounds. So in this example, you'd have to add back 1,050 pounds to your profits. Unfortunately, in this example, I've deducted it. Apologies, you need to add it, not subtract it. And there may be some other items which the revenue require you to adjust your profits for. One of them, for example, is deemed interest. There are certain circumstances that the government say if you make certain types of loans, it's deemed, even though you haven't charged interest, it's deemed that you have charged interest and you need to add those to your profits. So although I put chargeable profits of 10,150 pounds, actually if I added correctly the 1,050 pounds, uh, it would actually be 12,250 pounds. That's what the chargeable profit should be if I hadn't made a mistake in my calculation. But let's stick with the 10,150 pounds, because if that's what your chargeable profits are, notice it's different from your actual profits of 10,000 pounds. And this is because the law says there are certain items you can charge and certain items you can't charge. They're not saying you haven't earned the profits. They're just saying that we don't allow you to deduct those expenses for tax purposes. And sometimes it actually works the opposite. Sometimes you can actually reduce uh, your profits if the government, for example, is trying to incentivize certain behaviors, certain types of research and development, for example, um, the government say, if you've got research and development, would allow you to claim additional amounts to reduce your profits over and above what you paid in research and development. So once the law has either increased or decreased your profits, it's not talking about your actual profits that they're taxing, they're talking about your chargeable profits, the profits after these adjustments that are subject to tax. Then each state or each nation will have its own tax rates. In this example, saying the first thousand pounds, there's no tax, the next 2000 pounds, pay tax at 15%, and everything above that you pay tax at 25%. It just depends whatever your state charges. With corporation tax, typically they have a much simpler tax rate than they do for income tax. An income tax can get quite complicated, but whatever the basis of the charge, you come up with a total tax charge, in this case of 2,088 pounds. And I just wanted to highlight for you, if you compare the 2,088 pounds with the 10,000, that gives you an effective tax rate of 20.6%, or whatever the rate was, if you've done the tax charge correctly. And the reason I mention this is that some laws require you to disclose the effective tax rate. And the effective tax rate is simply the total tax payable compared with your actual profits, not your chargeable profits, because no one's really interested in that. Your effective tax rate is the actual tax you pay as a percentage of your actual profits, irrespective of what you aren't allowed to pay. So in this case, the tax charge is 2,088 pounds. In the journal I'm going to show you, it's 15,000 pounds. If your tax charge was 15,000 pounds, this is the journal that you would put through to put this through into your accounts. You would debit your profit and loss accounts 
with 15,000 pounds, and you would credit your liability at 15,000 pounds, because that 15,000 pounds will be due to the government whenever it's due under your tax laws. And in the UK, typically you've got nine months to pay your corporation tax. So if your year end was the 31st of December, you would have until the 30th of September the following year to pay that liability. As at the balance sheet date, that liability of 15,000 pounds is due. And it may well be that if you're doing management accounts, you get to the end of a particular accounting period, you may well look at what your profits are for the month and you'll make an accrual for the liability because even if it's not due for a long, long time forward, at some stage it will be due. And if you want to get a complete picture of what the profits of what your net assets and liabilities are and what your total profits are net of tax, you may want to accrue for the costs in the month. And again, there's a separate module for accruals, uh, which gives you more information about how you manage that. So in this case, we've, it's, we've had to spend 15,000 pounds paying tax. Let's say it's on 100,000 pounds of profits. So 100,000 pounds of profits before tax, we have to reduce, we have to pay out that 15,000 pounds. It's a cost to us, but it's not a cost of trade. It's a cost that the government impose as a matter of tax. So when we disclose this in the accounts, we actually distinguish our trading profits from our net profits after tax. So in this case, in the year 2021, we show profits before tax of 93,200 pounds. We've paid corporation tax, or we, we will pay corporation tax of 15,000 pounds. So our profit after tax is reduced to 78,200. And in the previous year, the equivalents were 75,000 pounds in 2020 of the profits before tax, corporation tax of 12,000, profit after tax of 63,000. The reason that disclosures work like this is it allows us to distinguish how well we've done from trading from how much tax we have to pay. And the reason for that is with our trading, we have control over what we make from trading. We have much less control over our tax bills. So corporation tax or income tax works fairly easily once you know what the tax is. And the accounting entry is just debit tax, charge in the profit and loss account, credit the liability. So the final tax I want to just talk about is payroll tax. And payroll tax is a bit more complicated simply because the cash flows are a bit strange. So the first column in this tells you the, uh, how the payroll itself works. And the second two columns talk about the cash flows. So I'm going to talk you through the first column. In the first column, we pay a salary to someone of £2,000. The payroll taxes, in this case, there's three separate taxes. This is the way the tax works. The first tax that's paid on the payroll tax is a tax that's due by our employee. And in the UK, we call it pay as you earn tax. And in this case, it's 300 pounds. And the government say, I want you to deduct the company or the employer must deduct that 300 pounds from the pay before you pay it to the employee. I'll come back to that in a minute. There's an additional tax, in addition to pay as you earn, or this is the income tax that a, an employee has to pay, called national insurance. This is a contribution to the health service. It's a different type of payroll tax. But again, this is a tax on the employee. And the employee has to pay out of their £2,000 salary a further £100 for the employee's national insurance. So the amount the employee earns net of tax is 1,600 pounds. And, but for the fact the government don't trust people to pay their taxes on time, you would, you would pay 2,000 pounds to the employee. When the employee fills in their tax returns, they would then pay 
the £300 income tax at the end of their tax year, plus an additional £100 for employees' national insurance. But that's not how payroll taxes work. The way payroll taxes work is the government say, you need to deduct those taxes before you pay the employee, and you must pay the employee net of those taxes. So the cheque you write to the employee is only £1,600, even though their salary is £2,000. And that's because the payroll taxes of PAYE and the employee's national insurance, the £300 and the £100, those are due by the company to the inland revenue. So they deduct it from the employee and it goes off to the inland revenue. So the cost of the company is £2,000, but it pays £1,600 to the employee to the employee and 400 pounds to the inland revenue or the government. Unfortunately, there's an additional tax over and above, which is due not on the employee, but due on the employer. So if you employ somebody in the UK, the employer additionally pays a payroll tax called employer's national insurance to the government over and above the 2000 pounds that it pays in, uh, of the salary. And again, that £180 gets sent straight to the inland revenue. So the total cost to the company or to the employer is £2,000 salary plus the £180 national insurance it has to pay. The total cost is £2,180. Seems a bit strange to me that governments charge a tax on people where they employ people because if you're trying to encourage employment, you wonder why you're taxing it. Well, that's a political question and they do it. So you just have to accept that's what they do. And the cash flows work like this. The company pays the employee 1,600 pounds. And typically it pays that employee in the month in which the salary is due, that's typically. And then it owes three separate amounts to the inland revenue, the £300 PAYE, plus the £100 the employee's national insurance. These are the monies that they deducted from the, from the employee, plus the £180 of employer's national insurance. When you add them all together, £580, and typically that's paid in the month following the payroll tax. So how does the journal work? How do you account for this? Remember, £1,600 is paid to the employee, £580 is paid to the government, and we want the total payroll cost to be £2,180. So this is how you account for it. When you pay the employee, the entries are quite simple. Debit payroll, £1,600, credit bank, £1,600. And typically when you enter the payment, uh, it's pretty simple and straightforward to do so. But when it comes to the end of the month, there's an accrual you have to put through, but this is a special accrual. This is an accrual that specifically relates to payroll. And again, apologies, I put the wrong figure in the debits and credits, but you're accruing 580 pounds that you owe to the government. So apologies, I put the credit to 1600 pounds. That credit should be 580 pounds. The journal entry is debit payroll 580 pounds, credit liability 580 pounds. So as at the end of February, we credit the liability 580 pounds. That's what we owe to the government next month. And the reason we debited payroll in this month is because our payroll costs are not just the net pay that we pay to our employee. It's also the taxes we deducted from the employee, which we're going to pay over to government next month. And it's also the £180 that we have to pay for employing somebody. So we credit liability because we owe the money next month we debit payroll and if you look at the total payroll debits in the month happily that equals the 2180 pounds which is our total cost and that represents the 2000 pounds which is our salary plus the 180 pounds which is the payroll tax 
on the employer. So the accounting works fairly simply. And then when we pay the government next month, the entry will be credit bank, because we've paid the money out to the government, we've reduced an asset, credit bank, debit, the accrual, the tax accrual that we set up with this journal, so that at the end of next month that disappears. And it may well be we'll set up a new accrual for the following month, but it all depends if we're paying payroll or not. So we've covered taxes. I spent most of the time talking about taxes because that's by far the largest amount of tax implications, of, of implications that we have for the tax and legal administration um, on bookkeepers. But I'm just going to very briefly talk about some other statutory requirements. And this is not a complete list, but these are requirements that impact on the accounting that we have. One is the legal constitution. I talked very briefly about a legal entity. Well, if you have a limited company, there's a whole batch of laws that relate to a limited company. If you have a trust, there's a whole batch of laws that relate to trust. If you're a charity, there's a whole batch of laws that relate to a charity. Even if you have a partnership where, th where three or four people work together just as partners, in almost all of them, you're going to have something called a constitution. The constitution sets out the terms that define how the entity relates with itself. Bit of a mouthful, how the entity relates with itself. It sets out the rules that everyone who's participating in this entity agrees to about who owns the company, how profits are distributed, and how the company enters contracts and appoints representatives to act on its behalf. All of these are kept within the constitution and typically a constitution will have sections that relate to its shareholders or its partners or its owners. It will typically have information relating to its directors, setting out what the powers of directors are, what they're allowed, what contracts they're allowed to enter into, what they're not allowed to enter into. And if you're doing the books, anyone's books, you really ought to have a look at find out what the constitution is in case there's anything in the constitution that you need to know about. For example, if you have to pay out a certain amount of profits uh, to certain types of shareholders, there's a certain type of shareholder called preferential shares, where they may get entitled to a dividend, which you have to pay on a monthly basis. It's quite useful if you're an accountant to know what the constitution says in case there's anything that impacts on your accounts. The statutory requirements also have a bearing on your accounting disclosures. So if you're preparing accounts, what we call statutory accounts, these are accounts which are um, required by law to be prepared for a public disclosure. Um, there's often, a, particularly with larger companies, there's a set of statutory requirements about what disclosures are required in accounts. And this is to make sure there's a minimum amount of information relating to each account so that if you're an investor or you're looking to lend money to a company, there's a minimum amount of information that you can gather from these accounts to help you make your decision about whether to engage with this company. As a bookkeeper or an accountant, you need to know what those disclosures are to make sure you incorporate them in your accounts. Then there's some other regulations. One, for example, is about data protection. There's various regulations about information um, that you are and are not allowed to keep about various people um, uh, that you transact with. So if, for example, you're keeping track of uh, debtors or creditors, um, that's information about people. And there's a whole set of data protection rules that require you to ensure the information is correct and you don't misuse the information. So since as accountants, we keep information about people, it's just as well if we understand whether we've complied with the data protection rules, whether we've registered under the data protection requirements in whatever country you're in, and whether we're keeping, we're protecting the information that we've got and we're only using it 
in the way which the company, the, the laws of that country require. Another set of regulations relate to money laundering, uh, and this is to try and prevent um, people using companies to launder money from crime. So there's a lot of very subtle regulations which basically require you to know who it is that you're trading with. And the laws are getting more and more tight as criminals become more and more sophisticated. So there's a lot of statutory requirements which uh, help governments to identify and to prevent money laundering. And again, as an accountant, you need to know what those regulations are so that you can comply with them. And there's quite a series of other regulations. And in each country, um, the other country's gonna have their own regulations. And because this can be quite daunting, what I'd recommend is if you go to the accountants, the external accountants that advise the companies that you work for or the businesses you work for, go to the external accountants and ask them to guide you what statutory requirements do they think you need to know in order to comply with the regulations that are imposed on the business entity by the law. So the final section I'm going to talk about is a bit of a um, off the wall topic, but it's one that I'm doing quite a lot of work with. And I think over the coming 10, 20, 30 years, I think an increasing amount of effort is going to be put towards this. And it's what I call social responsibility accounting. So this is accounting that doesn't involve money or doesn't necessarily involve money. What it's trying to do is to identify how socially responsible the company behaves. So in monetary accounting, we can identify what the profits or losses are of a particular company. We know how, mu how much money it's made. What we have no idea about is how ethical or damaging the company has been in order to earn those profits. So in America, for example, there were certain companies that used to discharge their, their um, manufacturing lead straight into the water supply, and they ended up poisoning everybody in the town. They made a lot of profits, but because the costs didn't relate to the company, no one even knew about it at the time, the monetary accounts simply showed the profits without showing the non-monetary costs. Social responsibility accounting is about trying to supplement the monetary accounts with some information about how socially responsible a business has been. And the reason I think this is useful for you to know is unfortunately there's a lot of organizations that really don't care about this. They only care about making as much profit as they can. But that's becoming less and less common. What I'm finding is most people are concerned about social responsibility. They don't want to earn profit at any cost. They want to earn profits, but not at any cost. So what we can do as bookkeepers is we can help the businesses focus on what it is that they want to do that's off the balance sheet, that not, doesn't involve monetary measures, but which involves social responsibility. We can help them identify, target what they want to do and to keep track of that social responsibility. So one example, there's essentially two ways, two styles of doing it, two techniques. One technique, is to identify a particular area of business that you can have a significant impact where you really want to make a difference. So for example, if you are conscious about your CO2 footprint, what the company can do is it can identify measures which indicate during a month on month basis how well or badly 
they are doing relative to that target. So the target, for example, might be to measure the amount of CO2 they emit and simply measure it and have some type of accounting system that keeps track of emissions. And when you report your accounting profits for the month, at the bottom, you'll have your CO2 emissions relative to what you're targeting. But in practice, that's extremely difficult to achieve for most people. So what I've seen some people do, and I've seen schools, for example, do this, or businesses, which actually is quite a fun way of doing it, is they uh, measure the amount of electricity they use on a monthly basis. And if they have smart meters, they can even distinguish which departments or which sections use electricity. And what they do is they set a target to reduce the electricity. So they don't put so much the target of reduction, what they put is the target they would like the electricity to be reduced to. And then what you can do on your profit and loss account when you're reporting your accounting is you show your profits in the month are 300 pounds. And then below that, you can say your target electricity was 75 kilowatt hours. Your actual usage was 65 hours. You've reduced, you've, you've, you've um, achieved your target and more. So you've successfully reduced your CO2 emissions. Now that's a simple example. And each company might choose their own method of identifying their social responsibility. It might be that they simply want to contribute uh, donations to charity. So that might have a monetary implication. Well, if so, highlight that in the accounts. Write a separate line saying your social responsibility charity donations and draw that as a separate line and identify what you actually uh, are achieving compared with what you are targeting to achieve. So that you're always identifying relative to the target. And what you're doing is you're drawing to attention on a monthly basis to the people who run the business, to what it is that they think they want to do to be socially responsible, and more importantly, how well they're doing it. You keep this at the front of their mind, you keep it raised, you keep a heightened consciousness of their social responsibility, it's almost certain going to translate into more socially responsive behaviors. So through this very simple technique of social responsibility accounting, you can encourage your companies to be more socially responsible. And as I said, my experience is the quite large majority of people want to make profits, but they want to do so in a socially responsible way. The ideal for them is to both make profits and to be socially responsible. And the second method, which is a little bit more um, foreign, but I think is going to have an increasing role in due course, is a method that both measures your contribution to social cohesion, your social responsibility, and it increases the likelihood of making profits going forward. This is the ultimate win-win. So the second technique is you measure the values that the corporation or the business carries out during its activities during the month. So it's a bit of a foreign concept if you haven't done this before, but you can actually measure the values. You can measure your integrity, your trustworthiness, your kindness. There's a lot of um, quite clever ways that you can measure it. And you measure it both at a corporate level. What does the management aspire the values to be? You can measure it at, a, at, an, at an employee level. What do the employees say about the values that they see the company carrying out? And you can find out what the local community think about the values. And when you can compare those values, you come up with a measure of what type of values you've got and how they contribute to social cohesion. So in this particular example, um, this is the Barrett Value Center. And they've got this really clever measuring tool where they 
go through to a company and they get you to fill in the values that you carry out during, uh, firstly, the values that you aspire to, and then the values that they actually see in practice in your um, trading. It's quite a simple process. It's also quite inspiring because it makes you think about what are the values that we run within our business. Um, and it gives you ultimately this sense of um, cultural health in their terms, or in my terms, is contribution to social cohesion. And it's measured in terms of a percentage. So a 0% is when you're really um, abusing all your employees, you're pumping out poison everywhere, you don't care about anywhere, anyone, the only, your exclusive interest is maximizing profits, however you can get it, whatever cost you have for anybody, you don't care, that would give you a zero um, cultural health rate or a zero contribution to social cohesion. The other side of the scale of one or 100 percent is where you are completely interested in the people around you, in the community, in the world around you, in making sure people are well looked after, in making sure your employees can live and that they're, they're not feeling anxious and that they've got a positive mental health. All of these contribute to an increased, all of these um, add to an increase in social contribution and the cultural health, cultural health figure would increase. And just one thing to identify is if you're a company and you're losing money, you can't contribute to social cohesion because if you can't afford to pay your employees, you're going to put them under stress so ironically, part of the measure of cultural health is not just how a company behaves towards other people, it's also how it behaves towards itself. So it's getting the balance right between its own interests and the interests of its owners or shareholders and the interests of everyone around it. That balance is part of this cultural health measure and you'll notice at the bottom of this, so I've actually included a disclosure, which shows total sales and revenue in this case of 35 million pounds, operating costs of 25 million pounds in 2019, profits of 10 million pounds. But look, the social contribution is 77%. Now on its own, you don't really know what 77% means. Is that a good or bad thing? I can just tell you anything above 50% is good. It's just the way these um, ratios are set. But you should aspire continually to increasing these rates. But what you're doing on a regular basis is you're identifying for the corporation or for the business both what its profits are, but also it's how it's social, how it's behaving with respect to the people and the environment around them not necessarily by reference to what they do, but what they intend to do. Of course, the difference is sometimes things happen where you have no intention, it's completely outside your control. What you do have control over comes into your uh, contribution to social cohesion or your cultural health. And that's largely to do with intent and how you carry out, put that intent into action. That's what's measured with these values measures. And here's the interesting thing. A lot of research has been carried out and there's now convincing evidence, comprehensive evidence that shows that the higher the cultural health a company has, the, the, the higher the social responsibility it takes that's measured, that's independent and genuine, the greater the social contribution a company makes to social cohesion, the increased its long-term profits will be. So a company is more profitable, not less profitable, if it cares more about the people around it. Even though in the short run, you'd say, how could that be? I've got to spend money on improving the environment, which comes off my profit figures. I have to pay more money to my employees 
if I want them to have a better standard of living, but that comes against my profit figures. How do I increase my profits if I'm doing all of this? Well, the answer is by taking care of the people around you, you do increase your profits in the long And the reason for that is that the people around you treat you better themselves. They become more loyal. They're more likely to buy from you. They're more likely to give you feedback of things that are wrong, which is honest, because they trust you and you trust them. And that feedback is everything you need in terms of determining how you need to adapt your business to what your customers need, to what your communities need, so that they will go on buying from you at prices at which you can make a profit. So the irony of social responsibility accounting is that by doing it, in the long run, you're actually going to improve your profits, not reduce them. So you can carry out social responsibility accounting from the very simple way of going through with management, asking them what they want to do, and drawing attention to it in your account each month. Perhaps you'll have to set up some simple procedures to bring the right information forward. It might be an electrical bill, it might be a water bill, it might be a satisfaction survey of the local communities, it might be some sort of charitable feedback. Whatever the measure is, you can just simply report it right the way through to creating a values profile in order to measure the cultural health or social cohesion, which itself has got a whole series of benefits to a company, to create a different a consciousness about what the company is trying to achieve. And the purpose of social responsibility accounting is to bring to the attention of management, not just the profits they make in a monetary sense, but the contribution they make to society. The wider the contribution they make to society, I think you'll find, in my experience at any rate, is most people want to contribute positively to society as well as making a profit. So if you want to be a really modern accountant, start to build in these social responsibility accounting ideas, which really can be very simple right the way through to very advanced. And that will bring you to a whole new way of uh, accounting. So just to summarize, uh, we've looked at the legal and tax context in which companies, uh, which businesses operate. We've looked at some of the implications it has for the business. Some of the most obvious implications are the taxes, and we've been through how you account for taxes. We've touched on a number of uh, legal requirements uh, on businesses, and we've touched on social responsibility accounting, and how that can help with business. So it's quite a lot that we've been through in this module, but I hope it helps you to develop into uh, a successful um, career within accounting. And so with that, let me say goodbye and thank you for joining us. Bye.